Hello everyone, Mr. Fawcett here, and we are back with another AP Calculus lesson. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion on particle motion today, so talking about uh, position functions, velocity functions, and acceleration functions, and the relationships between all three. And then we're also going to talk about uh, both net as well as total distance that a particle travels and how to find those things uh, towards the end of the lesson. So in this lesson we're given a graph uh, and the graph is, rep it represents a velocity function, so V of t, uh, measured in meters per second. So our x-axis would be seconds, y-axis would be uh, meters. First question is, at what value or values of t does the particle have no acceleration on the interval 0 to 10? Justify your answer. So when they mean no acceleration, they're talking about when there's, not, not when there's zero acceleration, but when there is no acceleration whatsoever. So no positive acceleration, no negative acceleration, no zero acceleration. So essentially where uh, you know, the acceleration function would be undefined. So pause the video, take a minute, uh, see if you can figure out based on the velocity graph where the acceleration function would be undefined on the interval zero to 10. All right. So Again, we know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Uh, so we're going to look for where that derivative is undefined. Um, we know that's going to occur at hard corners. So here uh, we could say t equals 1. Down here, t equals 3. Right here at t equals 6. And up here at t equals Eight. So at those four places, uh, the acceleration function would be undefined, uh, which means there would no, be no acceleration. Uh, let's see. It does say to justify your answer. Uh, so we can say because v prime of t is undefined at these va t values. All right, second question. Uh, it says express the acceleration function, a of t, as a piecewise defined function over the interval 0 to 10. So they are asking us to write out uh, the algebraic form of what the acceleration function would look like. Um, I would encourage you to pause the video, attempt this on your own. My hint is that uh, we are able to write functions for uh, lines, right? In the v of t, function is made up of different segments, so we should be able to figure out what um, the acceleration function is based off of what we see in this graph. All right, so I'm going to do this up here. So my a of t function is equal to, we're going to have a big bracket because we got a bunch of pieces. Well, my first interval is 0 to 1. v of t is uh, is a linear function over that interval. So really, we just need to find out uh, what the slope is, right? Because acceleration is the derivative or the slope of the tangent line to v of t. And the slope of the tangent line is constant uh, over the interval 0 to 1. Uh, we could run through the slope formula. You could do that. Uh, you could pick two points, these two points right here. We'll actually do that for one example, and then for the rest, uh, you could do that on your own. So I have the points 1, 3 and the origin, so 0, 0. So again, we know that slope is equal to change in y over change in x, which is equal to y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. Uh, so we're going to get 3 minus 0 all over 1 minus 0, which gives us a slope of 3. So the a of t function is equal to 3 from 0 to 1, not including 0 or 1. All right, our next little interval is 1 to 3, 1 to 3, because the v of t function is linear uh, between these two t values. You could go ahead and find the slope on your own. It's going to come out to be negative 3, and that is from 1 to 3. All right, our next interval, 
would be 3 to 6. Now this one's pretty easy, right? Because uh, the, the slope of a tangent line to a horizontal line is just going to be 0. So a of t is equal to 0 from 3 to 6. Our next interval, uh, I've already done blue, let's do green, is from 6 to 8. We have a slope of positive 3. That is from 6 to 8. It looks like I ran out of room just a little bit. Uh, our last interval will do an orange from 8 to 10. And this is a slope of negative 1.5. So negative 1.5, that is from, uh, I'll just erase this down here. That is from 8 to 10. So again, this is a large piecewise function because there's many different pieces, but you can see as we broke down the velocity graph into the different uh, linear sections, we were able to uh, come up with our acceleration acceleration function. All right, let's move on down to the next question. I'm going to try to keep the graph in here as well. Let me make this a little smaller. All right, so it says, for what values of t is the particle moving to the right? For what values of t is the particle moving to the left? Justify your answer. Uh, so again, I'm just going to do this up here so I can see the graph. Well, with the particle is moving to the right, that would mean that the position function is increasing, right? It's moving. Uh, the position function is increasing if the particle is moving to the right because the right represents the positive direction. So if we want to know when the position function is increasing, well, we know that this is our derivative graph, right? This is v of t, or we could call this p prime of t, right? Uh, where p is the position, p of t is a position function. Well, we need to figure out where v of t is positive, right? Wherever v of t is positive, that means that the velocity is positive and the particle is moving to the right. So we'll say to the right. on the intervals, and I'm going to use uh, parentheses and brackets for my notation here. Uh, moving to the right from 0 to 2, not including 0 and 2, union 7 to 10. So in those two intervals, the particle's moving to the right because v of t is greater than 0 on these intervals. Then we can do moving to the left. Right, the left represents the negative direction, which means we can think of our original function as decreasing, uh, which means we need to think about the derivative or the velocity graph as being negative. Right, our original function is decreasing when our derivative is negative. And you could think of something moving to the left or moving backwards when our velocity is negative. So to the left on the intervals, I guess I don't need that little little bar there. Uh, on 2 to 7. And that's it, right? That's the only time the graph is below the x-axis. So because v of t is less than 0 on these intervals. And I believe we have one more left on this page. Let's take a look at that. So it says, find the average acceleration of the particle on the interval 1 to 8. So we can remember that question. You can keep looking at it if you need to reference it. We need to find the average acceleration of the particle on the interval 1 to 8. So again, this is v of t. Uh, remember that v prime of t would be equal to the acceleration function. So if I want to find the average acceleration, well, I basically want to find the average 
slope, right? The or the slope of the secant line, which would be the average slope of all these tangent lines. So I can draw one secant line, or you can draw a segment. It's up to you. Uh, from oh, did they say one to eight? I guess I said one day. That's why I should keep it all on the same page. It is one to eight, so we need to get rid of that. Make it one is up here. This actually makes it a lot easier for us, right? Um, the average acceleration, well, we could go through our slope formula, but I think you under, I think you know what this slope is going to be. Change in y over change in x. It's going to give me 3 minus 3 all over the quantity 8. 8 minus 1, which is going to give me 0 over 7, which is equal to 0. Uh, so the average acceleration on the interval 1 to 8 is equal to 0. And we should have units uh, here because they give them to us. So 0 meters per second squared. Again, so if they ask you to find the average acceleration, they're talking about the slope of the secant line, which would be the average of all those, you know, the infinite number of tangent lines that we could draw from 1 to 8. All right, let's take a look at the second page here. All right, so come down here. Now we're going to talk about the differences between net and total distance. So maybe we've, again, maybe we've taken a physics course, we've talked about net and total distance in some other class. Um, the net distance that someone travels, let's say you go to the store uh, and then you go back to your house, right? If you start at your house, you go to the store and you come back to your house. The net distance, well, would be zero because you ended at the same spot that you started with. It doesn't matter what you did in between, the net distance only uh, factors in where you start and where you finish and the distance between. So we, another example would be, let's, and, and let me actually draw, let me, let me draw an example for you because I think that's gonna be the best way to show you the difference. Let's get a clean page here. So let's say we have a house. Up here we have, I don't know, some other building that's bigger. <laughs> let's say we have a tree over here. We can call that a park. Uh, you know, maybe there's a little path going around here. I, I don't know. I mean, our artistry is not my uh, forte. But let's say we have some distances here. We'll say five miles. We'll say 10 miles. And we'll say the distance straight from the house to the park is uh, 11 miles. Okay, so let's say somebody starts at the house and they travel to We'll call this the store, and we'll call this the park. So let's say that someone goes from the house to the store and from the store to the park. Well, the net distance that they've traveled is strictly the distance from where they started to where they ended. So the net distance here, net distance would be 11 miles because it strictly takes into account where they started and where they finished. The total distance is the sum of all the distances that they traveled. So they first went to the house, from the, they went to the store from the house, so that was five miles. Then they went from the store to the park, which was 10 miles. So we would have to add all those distances together to give us 
15 miles. So hopefully that provides a little clarification. The net distance is just the distance from the starting point and the ending point. The total distance is, the total distance is where you have to add up all the individual distances uh, that we travel. Let's say that someone, uh, let's, let's do a, another one where they say go in the reverse direction. I'm just going to erase these. So let's say someone goes from the house to the store. Oops. House to the store, back to their house, and then from the house to the park. All right, so net distance wise, well, it's still the same, right? They started at the house and they ended up at the park, so their net distance is 11 miles. Their total distance, well, they went five miles to the store, right? Five miles back to their house and 11 miles to the park. So their total distance would be 21 miles. Again, because we're just adding, uh, we're, we're just summing all of the distances that they traveled together. Okay, uh, let's go write some definitions and we'll look at a practice problem or two uh, for net and total distance. All right, so definition of net distance, the distance between the starting point and the ending point. Definition of total distances, I keep saying distances. Definition of total distance, the sum of all distances regardless of direction. So you could say the sum of all distances traveled. And that's actually how we'll put it. The sum of all distances traveled uh, in parentheses regardless of direction. So you may want to pause the video and make sure you get that down um, before we head on to our next question. All right, so if a particle is moving in the same direction the entire amount of time, what can be said about the net distance and the total distance? Well, and we're going to simplify this here. We're, we're not going to say that you can move at different angles. We're either going to say you can move backwards or forwards or left and right, essentially. So let's say somebody is only moving left or right. Well, if they're moving right the entire time, right, if somebody starts here and moves right the entire time, and let's say they end here, well, what's true about the net distance compared to the total distance? Well, let's just call this distance... I don't know, we can call it 10 miles. Well, the net distance and the total distance would be the same. Net and total distance are the same. Now, that doesn't hold true if somebody changes direction, right? So let's say that somebody starts here, uh, they go 10 miles to the right, but then they go three miles backwards, and then three miles forwards. So here, the net distance, right, they still end up from the red dot to the purple dot is still 10 miles. So they still end up traveling a net distance of 10 miles, but their total distance is now different, right? Because they traveled backwards three and then forwards another three. So the total distance would be 16. Remember, distance is always gonna be positive. So it's not like the traveling backwards three miles and traveling forwards three miles cancels each other out. It doesn't, they each count as three miles on their own. Um, 
So when a particle or a person or whatever's moving changes directions, that's when your total distance is going to differ from your net distance. Now we have two more things to find before we do a practice problem. Uh, we need to figure out how to find the net distance and how to find the total distance. So we've kind of talked about what, it, what they both mean, uh, but how do we actually come up with an equation or an expression for these two things. And to do that, we're going to do another, another graph. So I put a graph up here. Uh, I'm going to have a t-axis for my x-axis, because uh, it's going to be time in seconds. And my y-axis is going to be uh, in meters. And I'm just calling my graph uh, p of t, because it's a position function. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about how to find is the net distance. And this is the easy one to find because it works the same way every single time. Remember, net distance only cares about where you start and where you finish and the difference in that distance, right? The, it's always going to be positive, so it's actually going to be the absolute value of that distance um, or the absolute value of that distance, rather. But let's say this particle or person started at a position of 30 meters and they ended right we'll say this is where p of c is uh, they ended at a position of 10 meters well right we would say that they traveled 20 meters again distance doesn't care which direction it's always going to be uh, a positive number so the distance here would be 20. as a general rule right we could say the net distance is going to be, in this case, uh, the absolute value of p of c minus p of a, right? Or, because we have the absolute value, which is always going to make that positive, I could do p of a minus p of c, right? It doesn't matter which way you subtract as long as you know your final uh, number is positive. I could do 30 minus 10 and get 20, or I can do 10 minus 30 and get negative 20, but because I have the absolute value there, my final distance is always going to be positive. So again, net distance, you're just taking the final position, um, the difference between the final position and the initial position. And those are going to be the y values if you're talking about a position function. Total distance is where it gets a little more tricky. So let me draw that out for us. I want to find total distance. Because if you remember what we talked about above, right? total distance has to factor in the change of direction. Right, so uh, let me put another distance on here before we generalize the rule. Let's say this distance is, up, or this position up here is 70. So the particle first goes from 30, travels up here to 70, so they've traveled, right, a distance of 40 meters, and then they come back down here to 10, right, which we would be another distance of 60 meters. So the total distance here would be 100. Um, and it's easy to figure out when I give you the actual uh, y values on the graph. And the graph is um, you know, laid out for us. But we may not be given a graph, right? We may not be able to easily graph whatever algebraic function that we're given for position. So we have to come up with a formula. Well, if we break this graph up, between when a particle is always moving forwards versus always moving backwards, right? We could just add up the net distances. So if I look at the distance the particle travels from A to B, right? The particle is always moving forward, or we could say it's always moving to the right because the function is always increasing here. So I know that the net distance from A to B is going to be equal to the total distance from A to B. So I could do the absolute value of p of b minus p of a. Okay, that covers the distance from a to b. 
then I could add that to the net distance, which is also the total distance that the particle travels from B to C, because the particle is always traveling to the left or it's traveling backwards, right? It's, the function is always decreasing from B to C, so my net distance and total distance are the same. So I could add this, so plus the absolute value of P of C minus P of B. And of course, if the particle changed directions again and we had a third section, well, I could just find the difference between those y values and continue to add it to the distances the particle travels between uh, the other or on the other intervals. All right, so with total distance, you have to find those spots where the particle changes direction. And we'll talk about how to do that, right? Basically, uh, we can use derivatives. Uh, here, if the function is increasing, well, the derivative is going to be positive. When the function is decreasing, well, we know the derivative is negative. So if we can find that spot where the derivative goes from positive to negative, we know that's a, a point where the particle changes directions, whether it changes from moving uh, left to right or from right to left or backwards to forwards, forwards to backwards, etc. We just have to find those points of uh, of where the particle changes direction when we're trying to find total distance. Net distance, much easier. We just focus on the initial point and the starting point. We do not care what is happening in between. All right, let's quickly do one problem. I know we're pushing. Uh, I think we're going to be almost at 30 minutes for this video, but I think it's a discussion worth having. You know, before we actually get to that problem, I want to formalize what we just talked about, uh, how to find the net distance, how to find the total distance. There are a few more things I want to add to each thing uh, or each category. So I'm going to put these up here. You can pause the video and make sure you get them down. All right, so I just rephrased what we had down below. Uh, the net distance on an interval A to B is just the absolute value of the change in the Y value. So you can either do the absolute value of P of A minus P of B or the absolute value of P of B minus P of A. Uh, the total distance on an interval A to C is given by the absolute value of P of B minus P of A plus the absolute value of P of C minus P of B, uh, provided that T equals B is a point on the interval where the particle changes direction, right? So we have to break up this uh, formula based on where the particle is always traveling the same direction. So again, let me just draw a quick one more graph. I know I'm giving you a lot of visuals, but I, I hope it's helpful. Uh, let's say here's B. So if the particle is moving to the left from A to B and to the right from B to C, well, we have to break up those two, those two intervals and find the uh, net distance on each of them to find the total distance. So uh, we could say P of B minus P of A covers the distance where it's moving to the left, and P of C minus P of B, of course, the absolute values of those, uh, covers the distance it's moving when it's going to the right, and then you would add those distances together. That will give you the total distance. Okay, let's go ahead and do the one practice problem, and then we are out of here. All right, so it says a position of a particle is given by the function p of t equals 2t cubed minus 6t squared plus 8t, where p of t is measured in centimeters. Find the net and total distance the particle travels from t equals 1.5 seconds to t equals 4 seconds. Well, the easier one, right, as we talked about, is net distance, because we just take the absolute value, right, net distance is equal to the absolute value of the ending position minus the initial position or the starting position. And remember, we could switch those because we're doing the absolute value. Uh, so really, we just need to substitute into our uh, function. Uh, I'm going to get p of 4 minus p of 1.5. That's going to give me the absolute value of 64 minus 5.25. Uh, that's going to be positive anyway, so that's going to end up giving us 58.75 centimeters. That would be our net distance. Now, total distance, right, we have to think about 
if the particle ever changes direction, then it's possible the total distance, well, it, the total distance will be different than the net distance. So just by looking at the function, we may not be able to tell if the particle ever changes direction. Uh, if we think about what we need to look for to see if the particle changes direction, we need to look at the velocity. Does the velocity change from positive to negative or negative to positive over this interval? And again, the velocity is going to be the derivative of the position function. So p of t is equal to v of t, which here we get 6t squared minus 12t plus 8. So again, I'm checking the velocity function to see if that velocity changes signs over that interval. Two places we could look for where it could change signs. One where the derivative is undefined. Uh, well, this is a polynomial, so it's not going to be undefined over 1.5 to 4. Uh, the other spot is we could check to see if it equals 0. So I can set the velocity function equal to 0. And this would be a calculator problem, so you could punch that into the calculator and see if it has any zeros. Uh, turns out it does not. Um, you get a parabola that lies completely above the x-axis, so there are no real number solutions here. No real solutions. Which means the particle never... Uh, the velocity of the particle never changes, right? It doesn't matter to us whether the particle is always moving backwards or whether it's always moving forwards. I mean, we can tell that it's always moving forwards because P of A was less than uh, P of B, but it actually doesn't matter because all we're concerned about is, is the particle's velocity, is it the same sign over the entire interval? And if there's no spot where it's undefined or, whether, or where the velocity is equal to zero, then we know it has to be um, the same sign over the entire interval. So because uh, particles, it's not how you spell particle, because particles velocity And we do know it's positive here, so we can just say positive. Positive on, oops, positive on 1.5 to 4. Net distance. Having a really poor day with my penmanship here. Net distance equals total distance. There we go. So our total distance is also 58.75 centimeters. Um, again, you don't have to say that the particle's velocity is always positive. You just have to say because the particle's velocity never changes signs, on the interval 1.5 to 4, the net distance and total distance will be equal to one another. Okay, uh, that's going to wrap up this video. Uh, as always, enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you next time.